Hi everyone, Julia Usher, Recipes for a Sweet Life. Welcome back. Today I'm doing this underwater dreamscape cookie. I'm calling it an underwater ephemera cookie because it's got all these teeny little elements on it. It's also got a lot of color, so it's a little bit out of my norm as far as cookies go, but I think you're gonna love it and find it quite dreamy. But before we get into that, you're probably wondering why the heck I'm doing an underwater cookie here in the middle of one of the coldest winters on record. And that's because I'm actually on the verge of going on a cookie cruise in about a week. You are probably also wondering what the heck a cookie cruise was. I certainly was until I was invited to do it. But basically it's an event that involves cookie decorators and those interested in learning cookie decorating. And we're getting on a cruise ship and we're going to Cozumel and back over the course of a week. During that time, I'll be teaching some decorating classes. The organizers of this trip gave me the constraint of doing something in an underwater theme, specifically underwater steampunk. So this is kind of my take on that particular theme. I will say, admittedly, it's more ephemera with lots of those little edibles on it than steampunk. But there is a nod to steampunk here with the gears, the metallic gears here in the foreground. The ultra cool thing about it and why it's good for this course is that it's got about eight techniques on it. So it's a great showpiece. I can show people in one single class a broad range of tools and tricks that they can apply on any number of different cookies, even if they don't do this one. So that's the context for this cookie. I'm sorry if you're not able to join me on the cruise, and that's why I wanted to bring this cookie to you directly here on video. I think it's an extra special cookie, and I think everyone anywhere, even if you're not cruising, will enjoy it. So let's get started on what you'll need to make this project. For one cookie, I say start with two completely iced cookies. If you mess up one, you've got another one to play around with. I am using either a pale taupe color or a pale, pale, pale blue color behind them. I'll be airbrushing them in darker colors, so you need that contrast of background color to darker airbrush colors for the scene to really pop. So I've got pale taupe here, completely dry all the way through. We're gonna be using one of my stencils to form the background scene on this cookie. And this is the background stencil from my Prettier Plax Mermaid set. I'll have the link actually in my video description. To hold it down, you'll need a stencil frame or stencil genie, maybe an odd magnet or two to weight down particular areas of the stencil, and of course airbrush colors. We'll be airbrushing in three colors. Brown primarily because I want the pattern in the background to kind of recede and look more like a background and we'll have all the color really oriented in the dimensional elements on top. So brown is the primary color. I'm just going to be giving it pops of blue around the edge and little pops of electric green to highlight the seaweed but again most of the color is going to come in the foreground pieces. The primary foreground pieces you can see on this cookie are the mermaid and the fish and they're made out of rolled fondant that's been stamped and then dusted with luster dust. So to make those we're going to need just a little bit of fondant not too much just a few ounces because it gets very rolled very very thin. You could also use a white modeling chocolate here. The key is though it should start out a light color Assorted stamps, I've got mermaids, I've got fish. This is a self-adhesive stamp. You can also use wood-mounted ones. And I've also got tinier stamps that I use for shells and the little fish behind the big fish up here. Also wood-mounted stamps. And to stamp, I usually use the same food coloring I use in my royal icing. It's a liquid gel food coloring spread over an uninked stamp pad that has seen nothing before other than food coloring. Once those things are stamped and dry, we want to give them a, just a touch of color, a kind of just a romance or a glimpse of color. And I do that with a dusting technique, dry brushes and dry petal dust. These are dry, compressed petal dusts, which are great because it's tough to overuse them. They're pretty compact and hard. And, it, and that's great for this project because I just want a subtle suggestion of color on top of those fondant appliques. There are several other dimensional elements that I put on this to create this collage style cookie in addition to the fondant pieces. And three of those are piped. A two-tone seaweed, which I'll be showing you how to do. Little sea urchins, which are nothing more than royal icing transfers that have been painted. And then some overpiping has been applied on top. And then some sea anemone, which again are piped and then airbrushed for more dimensionality. So those are the three piped elements. Four more elements. Did I count correctly? Four more. We've got sea glass, which is nothing more than isomalt. I'll be touching on that briefly because I do cover it in other videos. We've got some molded cookie gears and anchors. Again, this is my nod to steampunk and the cookie cruise theme. These are molded and then sprayed with PME gold or bronze sprays, which I don't have out here, but you might also want to have. You can also use metallic airbrush colorings for that step. 
And then some store-bought elements, a little bit of raw sugar for sand, and some great chocolate-covered gilded rocks that look great among all the other ephemera underneath the mermaid. And I'll have the source for these in the video description. You'll of course need an airbrush, both a compressor and the gun. And I'm working with my Julia system, which will be coming out in the next few weeks, and you'll be learning more about that in subsequent videos. So let's move on to the first step of the cookie, which is getting the backgrounds on the fully iced cookies using airbrushing and stenciling. Those are the first two techniques of about eight that we're gonna be covering in this video. Now the first step is to properly position the stencil on the cookie. I don't want it centered on the cookie. I actually want to elevate it so I can fit more stuff at the bottom, which means the stencil genie is not going to secure it properly. I'm going to have to weight it down with magnets and also mask off certain areas at the bottom and the side. I also want to mask off the mermaid because I only want the seaweed showing in the final design. And to do that, I use little bits of painter's tape. That's the easiest way to do it. Painter's tape also lifts off the stencil very easily in the end, not damaging the stencil. However, I'm careful to apply the painter's tape with the stencil off the cookie so that it does not stick to the cookie because that can lift icing off the cookie. So I'm just going to continue to tape off the bottom part of the mermaid and now get the stencil positioned where I want it on the cookie and that is a bit higher. Now to mask off the bottom and the side, I can't use tape. I most certainly don't want to tape to the cookie as I mentioned before. So I'm going to use a little bit of plastic wrap here and then weight the whole stencil down in various areas, the plastic wrap as well, with little magnets. The key with stenciling and airbrushing is for that stencil to lie very flat across the entire cookie. Anywhere it lifts is an area for spray to get underneath and create a blurry pattern, and we don't want that. So that looks great. I'm going to be pressing down areas that are lifting with my trussing needle as I go, just to keep that stencil flat. Here I'm using brown, again spraying pretty close to the stencil with relatively low flow so I don't get a lot of underspray at a 90 degree angle to the cookie. And we'll just continue in that fashion until I've got even coverage. And ta-da! Now I did get some underspray at the bottom and here along the side under the plastic and a little bit here at the top. But fortunately, I can cover the stuff at the top with fish, and I think the stuff at the sides and bottom with the next color that's going down. This next color is a dark antique blue, which is a custom blend of sky blue and brown. And I'm shooting it at a further distance from the cookie just to shadow the edge with a slightly higher flow, a little more pullback on the trigger. And again, this is just going to create a sense of depth around that seaweed image. I think that looks great. And again, I blend in plastic bottles whenever I'm doing a custom color and quantity. Now onto my last color, it's electric green. I'm just shooting it again at a distance to highlight some of that seaweed namely those little frilly parts in the center that I really like. And I just think I need a little bit more green to highlight them perfectly. That looks great. Okay, let's move on to making the big fondant appliques that go on this cookie, namely the mermaid, fish, and shells. These are relatively thin fondant pieces, as you can see, that have been rubber stamped. And I've done this process before in other videos, so I will go through it rather quickly here. Basically, I want to run my fondant through my pasta machine to about the number four setting, which is less than 1 16th inch thick, but I started on the number one setting. If I try to jam it through the smaller settings first, it'll shred the fondant. The number one setting is my widest setting on my particular pasta machine, but every pasta machine is different. So just gradually work it through until you get it the proper thickness. I'm going to cut it into more manageable lengths because it's getting pretty long and I just want to make sure it's wide enough that it fits my widest stamp. And I'm just going to now move it from three to four and we'll be all ready to stamp it. Now this fondant isn't particularly tacky, 
Sometimes if it is, I'll lightly dust it with powdered sugar before I stamp. I'm stamping with the same food coloring I use in my royal icing, my liquid gel food coloring, and I'm putting it on an ink pad that previously had nothing on it. It's been previously colored with brown food coloring, but it's a food-only stamp pad. Squeeze on the coloring and blot off the excess, and then just stamp as you would any other craft stamp. Sometimes with big stamps, it's a little easier to see if they're inked if you stamp them upside down. And we're pressing into the soft fondant. It'll give it kind of an embossed look. And I use generally one big fish, one small fish, a couple of shells, and one big mermaid on each cookie. But you can do however many you want on each. The process is exactly the same. Now at this stage, I'm just going to stamp them out and then cut roughly around them with a sharp paring knife and let them dry overnight about 8 to 12 hours because I want the fondant to get rigid enough that I can pick up these pieces and trim them. If I were to try to trim them now, they'd be too squishy and I'd probably also smudge the food coloring on top. I'm just going to do the mermaid and then we'll move on to the drying and trimming process. That's not the greatest imprint. It's a little light in some areas, but she's good enough to show you the basic method. Again, just trim roughly around her, and then set her aside to dry for 8 to 12 hours until she's rigid, but not dry all the way through. Okay, now that these are partially dried, 8 to 12 hours, I can begin the trimming process. I start by using scissors, small scissors, gradually trimming down to the actual design. I don't want to trim too much off at any one point because I can crack the fondant. When I'm close enough to the edge of the pattern, then I take the tip of a sharp paring knife and I do finer cuts. Usually I'm really just picking away at the fondant and, and pushing it away from the edge. Here I've even moved to a smaller tool, my trussing needle, to get the fondant out of this very tiny area. Same process with the mermaid. In bigger pieces, do big broad cuts, though gradually at first with scissors, and then move on to smaller tools, paring knife to get really close to the edge, and trussing needles to really scratch away fondant in really tight angular areas. I'm working with satin ice, which is a relatively fast drying fondant. Just to note, other fondants may dry at different rates. Now we're ready to color these. Again, I just want a slight suggestion of color, so I'm using a dusting technique, which is using dry petal dust with dry brushes. And these are compressed petal dust, so they require a little digging, if you will, to get them out of the containers. And for that, I like to use a relatively stiff brush. It makes the color easier to get out of the container and easier to apply in a more focused way. The brush I'm using right now is a little bit soft, but we're going to work with it anyway. It might change to a stiffer one a bit later. Usually I dedicate one brush for light colors, like oranges and yellows, and then I'll have another brush for darker colors. And all I do between colors is simply blot off the excess dust onto a piece of paper towel. Now I'm onto my darker brush, and this is a fatter brush, but it's also stiffer, so the blue seems to be going down a little bit more effectively. Same process on the mermaid. I'm just going to color her up with pink and green along her body and some lighter shades for her hair and other areas. I like to fill in these areas that I didn't trim out with blue so it looks like the sea. I'm also going to get her fins blue as well just to contrast her body. And so with the dry dust and the dry brush, you get a very subtle coloring effect. If you were to get the brush wet, which we don't want to do, we don't want to clean it between colors, because if we do that, you'll get more of a painted look, a much more opaque look. So keep these brushes dry at all times. Just clean them on dry paper towel, dust them off between colors. And she looks great. So let's start first with the gears. I've molded lots of cookies before and I have a whole other video that talks about molded cookies. The key thing is to have an oven proof silicone mold because I like to bake in the molds. I get much more definition that way than if I were to put the cookie dough in here, drop it out and then bake it. 
I know these are oven proof because I've used them before, so I'm just going to go ahead and pack these. I just want to pack them to the level of the mold, so there might be some high points showing through. And these are great molds, I can tell, because they're super defined and they're also kind of deep, so these are going to have a lot of structure and detail to them. When the molds look less detailed and structured, typically the cookies coming out of them will look the same way. And I'll have links to all of these molds in the video description. So this is how you would pack a big one. Each cookie gets a big gear, a medium-sized gear, and then one of these teeny tiny gears I'm going to put in the mermaid's hair. So let me just pack that down to the level of the mold. And that's great. They would then go into the oven on a baking sheet 375 until lightly browned around the edges. I might press this down with the back of the spatula mid-baking, and then I'd invert them onto a cookie sheet, pop them out, as soon as I could handle the molds and you'd end up with something like this. Let them cool completely. Now I'm just going to tidy up, put this extra dough back in the fridge and talk about how I get from here to here. Once the gears are cool, if there's any overhang on them that occurred because the dough overflowed the mold, so you want to clean it up at this point. And the easiest way to do that is with the tip of a paring knife. Again, when the cookie's completely cool, you just kind of chip it away until it's nice and clean and all that contour and definition is restored. Then I want to spray them up. I'm using a combination of PME gold and copper luster sprays, so I have two different tones of metallics on the gears. You could also use luster dusts extended with alcohol and sponge on color as well. Now onto the first of the piped elements, the sea anemone. For the, these little guys, I need a relatively thick icing that holds its shape when piped through a pastry bag. And I'll have all the consistency adjustments and icing consistencies in a link in the video description. I start these by using a number 25 tip and creating kind of a mound. This just gives the anemone a little more height. Then I swap out to a number 133 grass tip. Now you could pipe these directly on the acetate, but you'd see you get a really short anemone. And this is why I create that underlying base with a number 25 tip. I'm piping on acetate, so when these transfers are dry, they'll just pop right off. And again, that's what transfer means. It means piping royal icing on another surface, allowing it to dry, and then transferring it off and onto the cookies separately. Once they're dry, they'll look something like so. You'll notice this one has a little bit of shading, and it's quite big. I just pipe many more blobs on top with the number 133 tip. Now I want to give them some shading. This half is not shaded, that side is. To shade them, I'm simply going to airbrush them with a little bit of regal purple airbrush coloring using the same process I used on the sides of the cookie with the blue food coloring earlier, spraying at a distance to just create a shadowing effect. And I'm just spraying largely on one side of the anemone. You want to do this while they're still stuck to the acetate, otherwise they'll blow around. And once they're all sprayed, you can pop them off quite easily once the icing is dry. Usually they have to dry overnight or longer. With a thick icing, they'll dry faster than with a thin icing. Now onto the second piped element, the sea urchins. They start with a round royal icing transfer onto which I pipe beads, and then I also additionally paint them. The painting can be done either before the piping of the beads or after, as I'll show. For this, I want a relatively thick flooding consistency, one that forms a nice round bead but still has some body. It might have a little peak once it's been piped like so, but it can be tapped down relatively easily with a trussing needle. And I want it to have body so that this doesn't look too flat when it hits the acetate, but rather has a little puff to it. I typically dry these in a food dehydrator at 95 degrees Fahrenheit as well. That also enhances the puff of the sea urchin. Now, I'm going to paint one first. And for that, I'm using purple airbrush coloring extended with a little bit of alcohol. And I'm just going to blot off the excess coloring on my paper towel. And typically, I just do five or six stripes down the side once the transfers are completely dry but still stuck to the acetate. Now, here's one that I piped dots on earlier. You can also paint in between them. Just make sure your paintbrush doesn't have any bristles sticking out as this one does. Otherwise, you won't get a completely neat job. But that's also possible, too. Now let's go back to the one I painted before. I'm going to show you how to get the dots down. For that, I use a relatively loose royal icing. I'm using white here that forms a nice rounded bead without any peaks. And I usually start with five or six tiny dots around the top, 
and then I pipe radiating dots from each dot down the side and then one line of dots in between the rows of dots I initially piped. Once all the dots are down, that's when you want to take them off the acetate. Once the dots are down and once you paint it actually. Now onto the third piped element for the cookie, the seaweed. You'll notice it's two-tone. I used both green and brown and darker green icing to create two types of seaweed. And to do that, I used a dual chamber bag with a dual coupler. Just fit one coupler down each side of the bag, and I'll have the source of this bag in the video description. You can also just put icing side by side in a pastry bag to do this, but I find I get better definition of the colors if I use a dual chamber bag. I'm fitting this with a number 349 leaf tip. I'm gonna work with two shades of green icing rather than the green and brown, but you have options. Now this is a notch tip. I'm gonna be holding the notch to the sides with the point facing up and kind of pushing, pulling back, pushing, pulling back, pushing, pulling back to create kind of a squiggly leaf, if you will. I like to pipe these in bundles of three two or three. And just to note, the advantage of piping transfers is that I can arrange them like a puzzle at the end on the cookie. I have a lot more flexibility in terms of how I arrange them than if I were to pipe directly on the cookie. You could, of course, pipe directly on the cookie, but here again, I just like the design flexibility. And once they're completely dry, of course, they pop right off the acetate as well. You could also pipe on parchment paper, but I prefer piping on acetate because it remains flatter as these longer elements dry. So we've completed three piped dimensional elements and also cookie gears to go on top of these lovely cookies. And I've got a fifth element for you, which is what I'm calling sea glass. I don't always use all five elements on top. You'll see as I get to decorating in the next step, sometimes I use three or four and then use some of the elements I didn't use on one cookie on another one. So across an entire set, I'll use them all, but not necessarily all on the same cookie. However, I am rather partial to the sea glass. It's shiny, slick, and just adds an element of pizzazz to the cookies. And also an extra element of dimension if I stand them, for instance, on end on the cookie as opposed to flat. So sea glass, what is it? This is actually a form of sugar. I'm using isomalt, which is less prone to clouding and getting gray or wilting over time as opposed to real sugar. You could start the same process with real sugar, take it to the hard crack stage and turn it into a candy. However, if it's particularly humid or you know you're going in and out of different temperature and humidity conditions with your cookies, it's always safer to use isomalt as it will end up looking better longer. And what is isomalt? It just comes in this granular form to which you can add a little bit of water to start. I always like to, to kind of turn it into a slurry, just enough to get it moistened. You don't really need much more than that. You could add a touch more. Or you can put it directly on the heat without any moisture. Just put it on low heat, allow it to completely melt, and then we'll crank it to high heat and then take it to certain temperatures before we add the color, a certain temperature, I should say, before we add the color, and another temperature before we pour it. So it's very important for this part of the project to have a digital thermometer, and I prefer an instant read digital thermometer that goes up to candy making temperatures, so well over 320 degrees Fahrenheit. You want one at least that gets to 320 Fahrenheit. And I like Insta Read because it gives me an instant read, so there's no guesswork involved, as there might be with a more conventional candy thermometer. So put it on low heat, let it melt, then accelerate, amp up the heat, and bring it to a boil. It's gonna boil for a while. You want it to hit 280 degrees Fahrenheit before you add coloring. In this case, I added a little bit of leaf green and yellow, just my same food coloring that I put into my royal icing. Give it a stir, and then you wanna take it completely up to 320 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 320 degrees Fahrenheit before you pour it. Okay, so why do I add the coloring at 280 degrees Fahrenheit and not at the end at 320 degrees Fahrenheit and just pour it? And there's a very good reason for that. That's because at 320 degrees Fahrenheit without any additives, this isomalt's at exactly the right consistency. Enough moisture has been boiled off of it that when it sets, it's gonna set to this hard crack brittle phase. If you suddenly add more moisture, and there's moisture in food coloring at the end, and then immediately pour it, it may never set up to this hard crack stage. It may just be kind of gooey. 
So you always want to add the coloring a little bit before 320 degrees Fahrenheit to allow enough time for any added moisture to boil off before you pour it. So that's really all there is to it. I'm not going to go ahead and boil this one because I've got a whole other video, my oven video, that shows how to do this in great detail. I'm just going to cut to a piece that's already been poured and show you how I break it apart. Just a brief note about what you're pouring it onto. Unlike these transfers where I was piping on acetate, I don't use acetate here because it'll obviously melt under the heat of the sugar syrup. So I'm piping onto parchment paper to keep the parchment paper from completely buckling and changing shape. Once I pour the hot syrup on it, I do have it tacked down with a little bit of shortening all the way around the edges. You could use butter too, and that just helps keep it flatter as I pour the sugar syrup on it so that once it's poured and set, it looks something like this. It's, it'll be one big sheet. Just let it cool down until you can touch it, and then I just snap it apart. There's no right or wrong way to do this, and it's hard to control how it breaks. But the beauty of this cookie is it's very natural looking, and so irregularity in these pieces is perfectly all right. Now you can make this well ahead. The thing I would suggest is that if you're not going to use it immediately that you take this whole tray or you take pieces that you've picked through that look better, you wrap them in plastic and you store it in an airtight container in a humidity controlled environment because if your environment suddenly gets very humid these could still turn cloudy. They may not remain as shiny as they're starting out here. These pieces have been made for a couple of weeks now and stored properly and they're still quite shiny. So that's it for the five embellishments on top. We're going to proceed now to putting it all together, which is a bit like a puzzle, but really, really fun to see the overall image materialize. Let's get those goodies on the cookie now. I'm actually working with a damaged stenciled cookie. I did exactly what I told you not to do. I taped the plastic to the cookie and I lifted some icing on the bottom and the side, but fortunately I think I can cover everything with these big elements I'm about to put down. My first step in decorating this cookie is to lay all the big elements, the mermaid, the gears, the seaweed, and some of the fish, just to get rough positioning before I glue anything down with royal icing. So that's what I'm doing here. I think I'm going to add extra dimension to the fish by elevating this big guy with a little bit of fondant, and then I can stick the smaller guy right behind it. That looks pretty cool. And of course I could do this with other elements too. But now I'm ready to glue, and for that I'm using a thick royal icing. I'm using a taupe color that's going to match the sand I'm going to put on the cookie later. And from here on out is just a gluing process, a gluing and pasting process. Of course, layering is a neat idea. I layered the fish as you saw. I think I'll also be layering some seaweed on top of the mermaid and probably layering the gears on top of each other. That just adds extra interest. Again, starting big to small, it's just easier for me to visualize the design that way. And the small stuff will be used as filler in and around the big stuff later. Can't forget the sea glass, it adds such nice shimmer, especially when it's oriented vertically. But to keep it up, I think I'm gonna need to use one of my other elements as a bit of a prop. Just a few more big elements to get down now before we move on to the small stuff. Okay, now that I've got all my large pieces on and some not so large pieces, I've got my medium to small sea urchins and seashells now anchored. I'm ready though now for the teeniest of tiny elements, namely the dragees and the sanding sugar and, and the remaining small gear. These elements will fill in a lot of the little gaps and things between the larger elements and just make the overall ground, if you will, the bottom of the sea look more continuous. So let's get started with that. Again, it's the same gluing process. I'm using the same taupe thick royal icing for this, or relatively thick. The beauty of the taupe icing is that it will virtually disappear underneath the sand I'm going to put down later and it's very easy to clean off because it is relatively light. So if any should stick out behind my little gear or behind this dragee I'm about to put down, I can easily clean it off with my trussing needle. The trussing needle also comes in handy for getting these dragees into place. 
Now to put the sand down, I apply a fair bit of icing and then immediately pour the sugar on it so it sticks. Don't worry if it gets messy. We're just going to sweep away all the unstuck sugar at the end and recycle it. I like to trim out the entire side of the cookie continuously with the sanding sugar or sand. And you'll notice how nicely it blends with the color of the taupe icing underneath. Now just sweep away any excess sugar that isn't stuck to the icing. Drop a teeny drage in the gear in her hair and we're done. Okay, and there she is in all of her underwater splendor. Even if you don't have a cruise to go to, this is a great cookie for a number of reasons. First off, it's really technique rich. As I mentioned at the beginning, we covered about eight different techniques, starting first with airbrushing and stenciling on the background, moving into stamped fondant appliques for the mermaids and fish. We then applied color using a dry on dry dusting technique onto the mermaids. I touched on painting and painting the stripes on the sea urchins. We of course did a number of royal icing transfers, the urchins, the anemone, the seaweed. We did molded cookies. I'm not sure how many techniques we're up to. We also sprayed those, not with an airbrush, but rather with canned luster sprays to give them sheen. And last but not least, we did some isomalt sea glass. So you can take any of those techniques, apply them as they are here, or extract the ones you really, really love and apply them separately or in different combinations to other cookies of other themes. I though do like this. I think even if you're not cruise bound, this makes a gorgeous little girl's birthday cookie. I can also envision it without the mermaid and perhaps with a stamped pirate instead and it would make a great boy's birthday cookie. Till next video, live sweetly. Thank you.